This is the second of two sermons from the book of Habakkuk. As we've said before, I know Habakkuk is a book you're very familiar with. I'm sure you have it memorized, and you should. It's a great book. It's a very short book, so it would be memorizable. But it's a prophet. Habakkuk was a prophet in the Old Testament, and the title of these two messages, the overall title, is a press conference with God replacing fear and frustration with faith and fulfillment. And the reason for that is, is that Habakkuk is unique among the prophets in that he only speaks to God. The entire book is a dialogue between Habakkuk and God. There's nobody preaching to people here. It's simply Habakkuk and God having a dialogue. So it's a very long prayer. And it actually ends, the section that's divided off as the last chapter, is actually a song. The book ends with a song. It's Habakkuk's prayer song to God. Habakkuk begins with his questions to God that are fearful and frustrated, but he ends with his prayer song to God in chapter 3 with faith and fulfillment based upon God's responses to his questions. So as we open the book of Habakkuk today and we consider it, we need to discuss prior to looking at Habakkuk a great principle in the Bible, a great truth in the Bible, and a reality in our life. We need to first of all talk about and define justice. I would submit to you that justice is one of the most powerful, instinctive, values and motivators in your life, in our life. For example, it's relevant because every day on the news, if we watch the news, we see people, even, even in Europe, in the streets, protesting, and the protests are in response to a perceived lack of justice. Justice is a powerful motivator. It's intrinsic within us. It's instinctive. And I believe that's because, it's my opinion, but it's just an opinion, but it's, I think, a valid one, that it's the residue of the image of God. The Bible says that we are created in the image of God. And God is the source of all justice. And I think that God, when He created us, He built into us that aspect of his character is a perception of justice. Now the problem is, because all of the truths of our existence that are the image of God, they are the residue of that, because sin and the fall and a broken relationship with God has effaced those characteristics of God, but it has not erased them. Christ comes to restore them. But we all have a sense of justice. For example, has anybody here ever been robbed? Anybody ever been robbed? Yeah, I have. And you have, many of you have, most of us have. How did it make you feel? Well, the feeling that you had in response to that was based on this innate sense of justice. Deep embedded within our psyche is a sense of justice. The reason you were mad, the reason you were angry, and the reason you wanted vengeance was because something that you possessed had been unjustifiably taken by somebody else who didn't possess it or own it. So you wanted revenge. You wanted justice. So what then is justice? Well, the dictionary says... That justice is the administering of deserved, key word deserved, the administering of deserved punishment or reward. Now, something we need to understand about justice, though, with regard to the fact that even though it's instinctive within us, as we mentioned earlier, it's been warped because of our broken relationship with God. Therefore, what we have done is we have perverted justice by having a standard of justice that we ourselves create. In other words, what do I mean by this? Well, 
let's use an extreme example. Adolf Hitler, one of the most infamous people in history. Agreed? He absolutely felt what he was doing was justified. In fact, he felt it was the right thing to do. So, in his mind, what he did was just and deserved. The problem with that is, it didn't square with God. You see, what I'm, what I'm saying is this. Is that, to bring it down to a personal scale, sometimes we get mad at people because they don't treat us the way we want to be treated. So we feel like we've been treated unjustly. May I suggest to you that you don't make the rules. God makes the rules. And the only way for you to be treated unjustly is for somebody to break God's rules in their relationship to you. Just because they don't treat you the way you want to be treated doesn't mean that you have any right to be mad at them or demand justice from them. Only if they broke God's rules in their relationship to you have you been the victim of an injustice. And if God's rules weren't broken in the way somebody related to you, then you just need to get over it. Because you're not the arbiter or the standard of justice. God is, and this book is the detailed articulation of God's standard of justice. So what we need to understand is that true justice, with a capital J, is only defined by God's law, and ultimately defined by God's law. And any system or standard of justice that is inconsistent with what God has already established is invalid. It's invalid. Pledge allegiance to the United States of America concludes with the phrase, with liberty and justice for all. That's a fascinating phrase. I've always been absolutely fascinated by that phrase. Because liberty and justice on the surface are not complementary ideas. They're contradictory concepts. Why? Why? Because they live in a delicate tension with one another. My liberty ends where your justice begins. I have the freedom to do, but I don't have the freedom to step on you to do what I want to do. So there is a limit to liberty, and it's tempered by justice. So when that phrase in the Pledge of Allegiance is repeated, I'm always intrigued by it. And I'm thinking, do we really understand what that means? What that means is that liberty doesn't mean you can do anything you want to. Liberty means that you can do what you want to do as long as it doesn't impinge on somebody else's justice. And the balance between those two is a delicate one. Now the other thing that's background information that might be interesting... It is to me, I don't know if it is to you or not. Is in your New Testament, there are two frequently used words. Just or justice, and the word righteousness. How many of you ever read the Bible and ran across either of those two words? Righteous or, and justice. Understand that in, behind those words, in the original text in which the Bible was written, in the Greek language, there are not two words. It's one word. The reason there's a word just in English and the reason there's a word righteous in English is because the Bible translators have chosen to use either one of those words to translate the same Greek word. So there is a, there is a critical relationship then uh, and an inseparable relationship between the concept of righteousness and the concept of justice. And it seems to me that that phrase, liberty and justice for all, is a great illustration of that because righteousness is the application of justice. Justice is God's standard of right and wrong. Righteousness is how we treat each other based on that. In other words, if we don't treat somebody based on God's standard of right and wrong, then it's unrighteous behavior. Furthermore, if we treat somebody based on God's standard of right and wrong, then it's righteous behavior. So righteousness is simply justice applied. 
But any attempt to define justice needs to be to start and finish with God Himself, who Himself describes Himself as just. In Exodus 34, the children of Israel had been called out of Egypt, and they were at Mount Sinai. God had gone up on the mountain and got the Ten Commandments from God. The first commandment was, You shall have no other gods before me. And before Moses can get down the mountain with the tablets, they were already breaking the first commandment because they set up a, an altar and put an idol. They, so they broke it before they, he could even get down the mountain with the commandment. So Moses breaks the tablets. God judges the people that are responsible, etc., etc., etc. And Moses goes back. God says, Make two more tablets. Let's do this thing again. While he's up there, God speaks to him in Exodus 34. I'm going to read surrounding passage, and then you're going to read a sentence with me. The Lord came down in a cloud, stood with him there, and proclaimed his name Yahweh. Then the Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed Yahweh. Yahweh is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and rich in faithful love and truth. Maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations, forgiving wrongdoing, rebellion, and sin. But, read it with me, He will not leave the guilty unpunished, bringing the consequences of the father's wrongdoing on the children and grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. So notice here, again, this balance and this even apparent contradiction. Because God first describes Himself as compassion, gracious, merciful, etc. But then He says, but He won't leave the guilty unpunished. Those are absolutely contradictory concepts. So how can He do both? We're going to answer that before we're through today. But the point is, He will not leave the guilty unpunished. God says that about Himself. God will never overlook any rebellion or sin, just like with Adam. All sin is judged by God. End of story, based on God Himself's statement. The Bible reinforces this. The Apostle Paul, Romans 1.18, read it with me. For God's wrath is being revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness and wickedness of those who in their wickedness suppress the truth. So not only will God judge, but the Apostle Paul uses the present tense, is, God's wrath is being revealed from heaven. He currently is judging <clears throat> and will not leave the guilty unpunished. So to summarize, justice is getting what we deserve. <clears throat> Justice is getting what we deserve. Mercy is getting what we don't deserve. Mercy is the opposite of justice. Mercy is the withholding of justice. It's the withholding of justice. And righteousness then is behaving justly and treating others with justice. So that's the relationship between those three critical concepts that give us a context to talk to Habakkuk and see what he has to say about the issue and how it's relevant to his conversation with God. So Habakkuk chapter 1 verses 2 through 4, read it with me. How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Violence is everywhere. I cry, but you do not come to save. Or see these evil deeds. Why must I watch all this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I am surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. The law has become paralyzed, and there is no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous, so that justice has become perverted. Now, the same passage we read for those of you that were here a couple of weeks ago, and understand that this was written 2,600 years ago. But it sounds 
like it could have been written yesterday, does it not? So I would contend that this is primary evidence of the continual, ongoing relevance of the Word of God. Things haven't changed much. And Habakkuk's concern is over injustice within the nation of Israel, within his own people Israel. Now, what he's saying here, and the crucial question, is justice. It's about justice, or injustice as the case may be. Habakkuk's issue is simply this. God, there is perpetual injustice going on among your people. Why aren't you doing anything about it? Why are you ignoring it? I know you're just. Why do you let injustice go on? You see, Habakkuk is effectively asking God, are you going to let them get away with it? Are you going to let them get away with it? Why are you letting them get away with it, apparently? Because I know this is inconsistent with who you are. Anybody here ever ask that question? Well, let's listen to God's answer. I'm going to read and I'm going to ask you to join me for a couple of sentences. And I'm going to read from God's answer recorded in Habakkuk 1, 5 through 11. The Lord replied, Look around at the nations. Actually, the word there, I'm, I'm sure, is goyim. I didn't look it up. Somebody can look it up if you want to. It's the word goyim, which means Gentiles. It, look at the Gentiles. Look and be amazed. For I am doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't believe even if someone told you about it. Now, read this with me. I am raising up the Babylonians, a violent and cruel people. This is not what Habakkuk wanted to hear. This, here, let me give you the functional equivalent of what God just told Habakkuk here. Let's contemporize it. <clears throat> There's injustice in America. All the things Habakkuk lamented to God in Habakkuk 1, 2 through 4 are injustice we cry out to God, aren't you going to do something about it? And here's what God's response. I am raising up North Korea to do something about this in America. That's exactly what he told Habakkuk. That is fully a contemporary analogy that is on point. And it's not what Habakkuk wanted to hear. It's certainly not what he expected to hear. Let's read on. They will march across the world and conquer other lands. They are notorious for their cruelty and do whatever they like. Their horses are swifter than cheetahs and fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their charioteers charge from far away like eagles. They swoop down to devour the prey. On they come, all bent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind, sweeping captives ahead of them like sand. They scoff at kings and princes and scorn all their fortresses. They simply pile ramps of earth against their walls and capture them. They sweep past like the wind and are gone. Now read with me. But they are deeply guilty for their own strength is their God. You see, that last line is the line that reassures Habakkuk. Yes, God is going to use a people more wicked than His own people Israel to straighten His people out. But God has not forgotten their guilt. And what God is effectively saying to Habakkuk in that last line is simply this. God answers Habakkuk, no. They won't get away with it. Nobody will get away with it. I'll have the final say. And the reason fear and frustration is, is changed to faith and fulfillment is because based on God's response and based on the ultimate, the ultimate uh, perspective that Habakkuk gets from God's response in chapter 2, 
he breaks out in his song of praise in chapter 3. Because what Habakkuk learns, Habakkuk learns from God is that question, will they get away with it, is definitively answered by God. No, they won't. Nobody will. Again, I ask, have you ever asked God, are you going to let them get away with it? How many of us have been treated unjustly? Somebody has broken God's law in their relationship to us. And the person who did that to us showed no remorse, they showed no regret, and they ran from responsibility. And they have apparently lived in relative ease and comfort while we've suffered the pain of their injustice committed against us. And we ask the question, God, where's the justice? Where's the justice? That's exactly what Habakkuk was asking. That's exactly what Habakkuk was asking. How many of us, when we've watched on television or on the news some really uh, well-known uh, case, some criminal case where somebody that was a well-known person um, was, was, was charged with some crime or something and, and the trial is publicized and then in the end, through some legal technicality or some other uh, uh, machination of the whole process the person is <clears throat> turned loose and you knew they were uh, it, it appeared obvious that they were as guilty as they could be and yet they get turned loose how's that make us feel what do we say will they get away with this that's our question that's what Habakkuk asked and Habakkuk comes to realize from his dialogue with God no they won't God will have the final say. God answers you, no, they won't get away with it. God tells us the same thing he tells Habakkuk, that he will not leave the guilty unpunished, as he told Moses in Exodus 34. Now, in our case, that sounds like good news, especially if we're the victim of somebody else's injustice. That sounds like good news to us. Until we read a little further and we read Romans 3.23. Read it with me. For everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's standard. Hello. Back up the truck. Guess who's guilty? You are. God will not leave the guilty unpunished. And that includes you, that includes me, that includes us. So it's good news when the other guy's going to get it. But it's not so reassuring we're going to get it. It's kind of like, I thought, I thought of the, the thought, how, how many of us have ever, have ever been in a, a store and we've bought something and the person, at, at the uh, clerk has given us the wrong change. They shorted us on our change. And we, we did, did it make us mad? Did you get mad? Didn't get mad. That's good. That's a good sign if you didn't get mad. I, I, I don't know if I'd get mad, but I'd be alarmed. <laughs> I'd be concerned. On the flip side, how many of us have ever had the situation where we have bought something and we've been given more than we deserved? In other words, we, we, were, we were given too much money back. And compare our reaction to getting less than we were supposed to get and getting more than we were supposed to get. How do we react toward that? You see, both were unjust. Both were equal injustices. But I think our reaction to getting more than we deserved is not quite the same as getting less than we deserved. Which is proof that the concept of injustice is perverted in our conscience and in our psyche. Because both are equally unjust. You see, we're really glad, we're really glad when the person that we think is guilty is going to get what's coming to them, but we're not so glad when we realize we're the guilty party. And we're going to get what's coming to us too. You see, our liberty ended 
when God's justice began. God gave Adam, God gave Eve absolute freedom in the Garden of Eden. They had the full run of the place. It's all yours. But liberty ended when it came to the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And guess what? They stepped over the line. And we've all paid for it ever since. That's what the Bible says. Where does that leave us? Well, 1 Peter 3, verse 18. Read it with me. For Christ also suffered once for sin, the just for the unjust, in order that he could bring you to God. What? Look at the terminology that's used by the Apostle Peter to describe Christ and what he did at the cross. The terminology is the words just and unjust. Isn't that fascinating? And you see, what we clearly see here is that Christ, who was just, He he had no guilt. He had no guilt. That Christ fully died for those who were guilty in order to bring us back to God. Christ has made peace with God. Do you understand that outside of Jesus Christ, the Bible says that we... You, I, outside of Christ, the Bible says that you are God's enemy. You are naturally born an enemy of God. I didn't say it, the Bible does. Romans chapter 5. But Jesus has made peace. We who were once enemies are not only friends, we're children in Christ. We're part of the family. The just for the unjust. You see, God's justice demands death for sinners. We discovered that back in Genesis chapter 2. God's justice demands death for sinners. The Bible says in Romans 6.23 that the wages, the payment of sin, is death. And God does not leave the guilty unpunished. He said it Himself. Furthermore, Jesus' death satisfies your death sentence. You see, effectively, who in here trusts Jesus Christ this morning as your sin bearer and Savior? Raise your hand if you're trusting Jesus Christ right now as your sin bearer and Savior. Okay, here's the reality. If you have actually done that, you you were on death row. Imagine being on death row. Imagine with me for a minute. And you're getting ready to eat your last meal because you know what's happening in the morning. And right as you're eating your last meal on death row, somebody comes in and says, opens the door and says, Hey, you're out of here. You're free to go. Somebody else came in who didn't commit your crime. And we're going to kill them instead of you. And it's going to satisfy because somebody's going to got to die for this crime. So we're going to kill them instead of you so you're free to go. You see, every one of us are former death row inmates. And we've been set free. Now, how do you think that should make us feel and respond to Christ? And why should we be willing to sing and worship and celebrate and encourage? You see... The only downside to that analogy, if I'm the guy that's been set free from death row, I'm happy that I'm not in the electric chair the next morning, but I'm really sorry that the guy that's there is in the electric chair. And how would we feel toward him or her? That's how we should feel toward Jesus. And the icing on the cake is, though, that three days after he comes into the jail for us and gets executed... Three days later, he shows up at our house for supper. And that's what happens every time we go to the communion table. Because he died but lived to tell about it. He took us off death row. He died in our place. Then he rose to celebrate it with us.
And that's why we need to celebrate if we truly trusted Christ and we need to show affection and obedience to Him as a great big thank you to all He's done. Just like we would feel toward the person who came and took our place on death row because that's exactly what Jesus did. You see, God satisfies His own justice and will forgive you because in Jesus' death, your sin has been punished. God will not leave the guilty unpunished. And in Jesus' death, your sin has been punished. Why am I passionate about this? Why is this a big deal to me? Because God used this truth many years ago to liberate me in my understanding and give me an assurance of my forgiveness and my relationship with Him like I'd never had before. You see, when I came to the realization after reading the Bible over and over again, God didn't forgive me just because He, he doesn't, you know, hey, well, Brad's a good guy, we'll give him a pass. God doesn't look at you and say, oh, you know, I know them, they're okay, we'll just let it slide. No, that's not who God is. That's not, not anywhere close to who God is. What I realized was that the reason I could have confidence in my forgiveness, just like you can have confidence if you've truly turned to Christ and are trusting Him, is that my forgiveness is not based on feeling or arbitrary decision. My forgiveness is based on a legal proclamation. The death sentence has been satisfied. Christ died. This is a legal act. And there is no double jeopardy. God will not ask you to pay for the crime twice. And I realize that when Jesus died, He was taking eternal judgment for Brad, and my sin was functionally judged. So I can be confident that God is not going to be arbitrary about forgiving me if I turn to Him in absolute confidence because he's saying, hey, it's already been paid for. You don't have to pay for it again. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Last month, Pam and I had the exhilarating experience of making the final payment on a car loan we'd been paying on for many years. <laughs> Anybody know that feeling? <laughs> last month was the last payment. <laughs> I mean, that thing, it was, it was, you know, like, wow, this is weird. I don't have to make this payment this month. But you know what I didn't do this month that I've been doing for a lot of months previous? You know what I didn't do? I didn't send a check. How stupid would that be? Right? I mean, the loan's paid off. Why should I just out of habit or just because I don't really believe it's paid off write a check and send it to them? That's dumb. So I'm not real smart, but I'm that smart. I didn't do it. But you know what? Refusing to follow Jesus Christ is dumber than that. Why would anybody want to still have to pay for their own sin when Jesus has already satisfied the sentence? Jesus has already paid it off. In Jesus' death, God's justice against us has been paid in full. God will not leave the guilty unpunished. People can either choose to take it themselves or believe Jesus has already taken it for them. I'll take the latter.